I have the honor of trying the topic of today's conversation, methodology, for a whole week. And let me tell you, it's really good. The food was delicious, easy to make, and for a whole week, I didn't have to think about anything I was making or preparing for myself, just my family. Scaling a food business is really hard, especially a fresh food business. But today's guest, Julie Nigan, co-founder and CEO of Methodology, has found a way to do it, and she's profitable. Methodology revolutionizes the food and wellness category by delivering sustainable food as medicine pre-made meals that bridge the gap between the world's leading medical and nutrition experts and people who crave high-quality, satiable nutrients. You'll hear how this company got started and grew, now shipping nationwide. You can find more at gomethodology.com, but for now, come on in and meet Julie Nigan. Welcome back to another episode of Dear Founder. I am so excited about today's guest and about her company. And I do very much believe, as many of you know, in like karma and signs. And I myself have been having some health issues, nothing major and nothing crazy, but I have been exploring new ways to update my own diet. And I feel like this pitch for today's conversation landed in my inbox at the perfect time. So I am so excited that Julie Nguyen, who is the CEO and co-founder of Methodology, is here today to talk all about her business and to share her story. So Julie, welcome to Dear Found Her. Thank you so much for having me. So I was just telling you, I'm like obsessed with your company. I'm so excited to try the food. And by the time we air this, I will have tried the food. So I will definitely make mention of that in the introduction. But I want you to Start off by telling us your story. I started methodology almost 10 years ago now, which it feels crazy saying that because I had so many health issues in my teens and 20s. And I, had, I was on prescription drugs for eczema, asthma, allergies, um, anxiety, insomnia. And during all that time, not a single doctor ever asked me about my diet. And so one day I had put myself on a diet because I wanted to lose weight. I had like a bet with my roommate. He was trying to gain more weight uh, than I could lose. And so I did Whole30 and I did it for weight loss. And then during that time, almost all my other health issues went away. <laughs> like, And I was like, what? I had no idea that diet affected other things besides my weight because no one had ever taught me that. And I was kind of, I was shocked by it because I had one of the best educations in the world. I went to Stanford, I studied econ, working on Wall Street, and I thought I was smart and knew how the world worked, but I suffered for so long and doctors were just treating my symptoms. And so once I learned how to eat properly, I basically lost weight, healed my body, felt like a completely different person, looked like a completely different person. And in order to actually stay on track, I was meal prepping every Sunday because it was literally impossible to find whole foods, you know, from restaurants. And so I was meal prepping on Sundays and working in SF, working crazy hours. And at a certain point, I just, I was fed up of meal prepping every Sunday because, you know, I could only do it for so many years and I was tired. And as I moved up in my career, my hours got worse. And so I started trying other, I started trying meal prep services and they were just all so bad because they were all started by bodybuilders in a lot of cases. And even though I do appreciate the importance of following macros to uh, hit targets for weight and building muscle, I also want my food to taste good because Food for me has always been a source of joy and pleasure and connecting with family and friends. After trying all the meal prep services, I was literally shipping meals even from New York to SF. Um, I eventually just hired a personal chef to cook for me exactly the way I wanted. And I was like, listen, I don't want the $15 a meal meal prep. I want the $25 to $35 a meal meal prep because I can afford it. I want the best ingredients. I want it cooked in avocado oil. I want all the beef grass fed. I want all the seafood sustainable and wild, right? Because this did not exist anywhere in America at the time. And so I did it for myself and I emailed my friends and I was like, listen, who wants in on this? I'll manage your food. We might as well just all pool and share a chef. And people 
kept asking to get added and added and added. And I was loving the process of designing menus and helping my friends eat healthier. It was so fun uh, that my co-founder and I, after working on it for a couple of months, we decided to just go all in. And so I liquidated my retirement fund and use that to buy an existing catering kitchen out so we could start methodology. And that was about nine years ago now. So one of the things that I love about your story is that it is so entrepreneurial in the sense that so many entrepreneurs start a business out of a personal need. And, but at the same time, very few take that business to the level that you've actually taken it to. And I, I can relate so much to your story even just from my own first business, when I started Bump Club, like I needed mom, I needed friends who were pregnant. And so I started hosting events. It was as simple as that. You needed food that would help you to maintain this healthy lifestyle that you wanted to maintain. And so that's what you did. And I, I love the progression and I love how you really have taken that foundation and built upon it. And so I would love for you to kind of talk next steps when you did liquidate your savings, you bought this kitchen, then what? Yeah. So that's when I learned the hard way. One of the pieces of advice that I thought I would definitely share on this podcast. So my first year in the business, my co-founder and I took no salary. I worked hundred hour weeks. Um, we were in the warehouse and kitchen seven days a week. He even slept on a hammock there actually, because we were working such crazy hours and at a certain point, we were all like almost at our breaking point, the lack of stress, the lack of sleep. Um, my entire, I had just burned through my entire savings. Like I went down to like a net worth of zero, right? Um, and so at that point, someone gave me the advice that I want to pay for because my co-founder and I took it at the time. And she said to me, because she was further along in her journey, she said, you have to stop being the mule for your business and make your business be the mule for you. And so ever since then, my co-founder and I have gotten together every year and we have written personal OKRs, like where, what do we want to do, achieve, become in our personal lives? Whether it's, I want to travel to three countries this year. I want to be able to take one month off. I want to be able to, you know, learn a new language or whatever it is. I want my income to be at this level, right? I want to be able to take work this many hours a week. And then we work backwards from there to build the business in such a way that we can have the lives we want professionally and personally. And ever since we started doing that, I mean, we've just loved our jobs and we we now run the business in such a sustainable long-term way because we're not in any kind of rush to sell it, if that makes sense, because we love it and it's not burning us out. And we're enjoying the process of building the brand, launching new products. And so you know, because those those first few years were so brutal and literally, I mean, I started a health food business and I was healthy at the time I started it. But I mean, if you saw how haggard and overweight, because I didn't even I didn't even go to the gym, you know, like I looked in years one, two, three, because I was just living at the warehouse. Um, something had to change because at that point, I mean, the number of times I cried to my co-founder and said I wanted to quit. I can't do this. Um, I'm not smart enough. I'm too tired. I'm sick of being broke. Um, because it, you know, it's just hard. It, it was just hard that transition. So, um, learning how to actually not be a mule for your business and just sacrifice everything for the business. Cause that's just, that's just not a sustainable way to run a business. No, it's not. And so, okay. So when you started this, the thing that I'm most intrigued about with your business is how you've scaled it. Because let's be very honest, scaling a business that is built upon the foundation of fresh food and a meal service is a really hard, that that, that is hard. You are dealing with a lot of stipulations and a lot of, there are probably a lot of parameters and with shipping and the freshness. I mean, there's just so much to think about but you do ship nationwide. So I want to kind of talk about the process of getting to where you are today. So when you first started, my guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you were only probably serving meals to people in the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, how did you get the word out about your service and your product? When we were first live only in the Bay Area, you're correct about that. We tried every kind of marketing channel to get the word out. We 
went to different events at gyms, right? Um, we did paid ads on Meta. We did paid ads on Google. We did partnerships. And what ended up working best for us, actually, and I truly believe this is the case for most businesses, is that you'll test a lot of channels and then really, you really only need one or two to crush it for you. Obviously, it's awesome if they all work, but I know a lot of CEOs. I don't know anyone who crushes it in every channel. <laughs> you know, like I can't think of a single one. And some of them are running massive businesses, right? And so fortunately for us, I think because my co-founder and I are so aesthetically oriented, we killed it on Instagram from very early on and have always designed our product experience around being Instagrammable. And so um, we are known for packaging food in these glass jars with pink lids. And when people see these meals on an Instagram feed, they, they really stand out because they don't look like any other meal prep service. So you instantly see this is branded, high quality packaging. It doesn't look like it was made in someone's garage or kitchen, right? And then it also immediately communicates the value and the standards of what's inside, right? Because if we're taking that time and money and investment in the packaging, obviously we're doing it with the food and the meals as well. So for us, we were able to grow through Instagram and by really clearly differentiating visually in a way that people could pick it up in two seconds while scrolling on a feed. So how did you break out of only delivering in the Bay Area? And I think that that was, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm guessing, but that when you did that, that was probably the big turning point for your business. Yeah, we launched Southern California once we were ready to. Every time you scale or add a new market, it adds a whole bunch of complexity to the supply chain because you have to change your whole production production schedule in order to account for it, in order to have contingencies in place. And so it was something that we did really, really carefully. Um, we have always scaled extremely carefully as a business. There are a lot of businesses that started at the round at the same time as we did. And we probably went nationally three or four years later than all the peers in our cohort um, because we wanted to do things properly. So for us, like going nationally, for example, we didn't want to do it until we had uh, a version of packaging that was reusable and also light enough to ship. So everyone else was shipping um, one-time use plastic. And we didn't want to ship until we had reusable bentos, both jars and bentos that were light enough to ship. And so we had to actually develop that solution because there is technically nothing on the market today besides what we package our food in that is light, reusable, safe to eat out of, microwavable, and leak proof, right? There's no such thing um, because everything out there is single use plastic or it's compostable but it's not leak proof and it gets really soggy over time as food sits in it, right? So we had to take the time to invent the packaging that we needed that we felt was worthy of our food and our brand. And it took a few years. We had to literally build a, you know, assemble for this project, a team of engineers and manufacturers to solve this for the first time. And also it needed to be affordable, right? Um, it couldn't be something that was like $3 per bento. So it took years to figure that out. It was the packaging that was the bottleneck. Um, but it was worth it because now we have reusable, leak-proof, light, beautiful branded packaging and no one else does. And our customers feel good about it because it nests nicely. You finally find a solution to package your products and you decide you are going to start shipping it nationwide. Are you still relying solely on Instagram for that word of mouth marketing because shipping nationwide is far different than shipping within the state of California or your local community. I mean, it's a far different animal. So how did, how did you get the customers to, to trust you to ship their food? That is a great question. I mean, we still rely primarily on social media and influencers to grow and, the reason why it really works for us is because our product truly is differentiated. There are hundreds of meal prep services in America 
but they are all playing in that $15 price range. And we are $10 to $15 more expensive than that. And the reason why only we are doing it and the others aren't is because if you are going to charge that price, you need to deliver that level of value, which is very hard to do. You can't just decide as a $15 a meal service one day, oh, let's just go into luxury and start making $30 meals because the number of challenges that you need to solve from packaging to ingredient quality sourcing, right, to menu design, to quality control. Um, it would be like someone who sews their own clothes at home and is like, I'm going to compete with Prada and start, you know, making sweaters today, right? Like, it's just not how it works, right? So for us, we don't have competition, literally, in our price point in the meal prep space nation nationwide. So we spend a lot of money on not only the user experience and making sure it's phenomenal and luxurious, um, but the content that we create. We invest so much in content creation because when someone sees one of our ads, they need to immediately understand that this is a luxury product. And so the consumer who can afford it needs to immediately understand like, this is for me, right? Um, this is finally a, a service that's going to check all my high maintenance boxes. I want you to tell us a little bit more about the product and what people actually get. And yes, it is a luxury product. I think that's a good way to describe it from a price point, but it's not a luxury, a luxury product from like a necessitation. Like a lot of times when you think of a luxury product, it's like a want, right? This isn't necessarily a want. I mean, this is a product that actually will help you and your life. And it's what you put into your body. So it's very different than carrying around a Prada bag, right? I mean, this is, this is what you're feeding yourself and what you're using to fuel yourself. And you can see the results from eating this way. And so I want you to talk a little bit about the method of methodology. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. So I named the business methodology because I believe that the way we eat is one of the things that affects our overall health and quality of life more than anything else. And when I was looking around at even my own peer group, everyone was eating so haphazardly and reactively and not intentionally and proactively. And I said, people need to have a methodology for how they approach their eating that is actually going to help them build the bodies and the lives that they deserve and want to live. So that was the whole like mission behind it. How do we heal bodies and minds, right? Using food as medicine. And the and mind something is we add something we added years later because it's important to us that people enjoy the process of eating healthy. It is done in a sustainable way. They never feel deprived. They never feel like things they love are off limits, right? Because we just we don't want to encourage anything that's like extreme. So we I wanted people to have a methodology for eating. I wanted it to be the most healing, optimally healing food out there. So my co-founder and I always say, people laughed at us when we first said this, by the way, early on. I was like, we are reimagining the way people eat at home to be, you know, completely optimally healthy, but also really delicious. And I remember just people laughing at that because they just thought it was unrealistic, you know? Um, and it, it is a really hard thing to solve. How do you reimagine the way people eat at home, right? And, but it felt like such an important problem to solve because most of the meals we eat are the ones at home, right? And why should the meals we eat at home be monotonous, not that healthy, right? Um, and often not that tasty if we're not a good home chef, right? So I wanted to solve all these problems. How do we design something that's easy, that's going to make you feel progressively healthier every day the longer you stick with it? but that also tastes as good as what you would get at a restaurant, like a professional chef made it. So those were all the boxes that we wanted to check. And in order to check those boxes, we needed to design beautiful packaging that would not only house the food in a way where when you open your fridge, you feel excited about what you're about to eat, but also keep the food incredibly fresh, right? We needed to solve for ingredient quality. So we now have a farm in Southern California that grows custom produce for us. We're talking fine dining quality, grown in greenhouses, hand harvested, because 
we were tired of not being able to get the ingredients we wanted to use into our meal. So we had to solve for ingredient variety and ingredient quality with everything from produce to grass-fed meat to seafoods, right? Um, we had to learn how to design menus with that check all the boxes. They're going to be calorie controlled. They're going to be high protein, right? So the breakfasts have at least 30 grams of protein on average. The lunches and dinners... 40 to 55, depending on whether you're getting a standard or a large size. So you're going to get, you're going to hit your macros. You're going to have 25 grams of fiber a day, right? So it's going to check all your dietary boxes, but it's also going to be so fast. You can heat it up in five minutes or less uh, on a pan or in the microwave because things need to be convenient for today's customer in order for them to do it consistently and to not get lazy and order DoorDash instead, right? Um, so it needed to be really fast. And then it needs to be delicious because if you take two or three bites out of a meal prep and you don't want it, well, one, you feel like you wasted money. Two, you're going to throw it away and order that burger instead or grab like a bag of chips or whatever. And like, that's not what we want because we are in the business of transformation. So we really needed to check all those boxes. And so that's what methodology does today. So when you sign up for our service, you will go through a little bit of an onboarding experience and then you will get a nutrition program. That is going to be calorie controlled, going to help you hit your protein targets, going to help you hit your fiber targets. You're going to eat one to 200 unique plants a week, something you can never do grocery shopping on your own, right? You're going to improve. So you're going to improve your gut health. You're going to get rid of hunger and cravings because you're finally nourishing your body so optimally. Um, you're going to feel better than you ever have before and things that you never realized were affecting you. Um, because of your diet are going to start to get better. Like people are surprised when all of a sudden they are sleeping better or their partner sleeping better because they're not snoring anymore because they've lost weight or, you know, their skin is clearing up. The eczema is gone. The acne is gone. Right. So it's so much more. And then just mood, right? Serotonin, dopamine, all of these things need the right nutrients, the right amino acids in order to be produced optimally by the body. So literally everything transforms. And one thing that I love about it, what I love about eating optimally is that there are things that immediately feel better, like right after the meal, you know, after one day, after two days, after three days, you're going to notice more energy, less bloating, less hunger, fewer cravings. There are things like that that come right away, which is great because everyone wants that quick fix, right? And then there are the things that take longer, which are so cool. Like, you know, the weight loss will probably come more gradually because it's not some kind of restrictive diet, right? So, but that'll come gradually. You stick with our program and then three or four months later, everyone's going to be like, what on earth are you doing? And this is why we have, we call our members lifers internally because, you know, once you do eight, four to eight weeks of it and experience that full body and life transformation that comes from eating optimally, uh, you don't want to go back. <laughs> to the way you felt before. There's no turning back. So either you're going to stick with us or you're going to learn to prep it all on your own if you have the time for that or you have that, you know, you miss the joy of cooking. But for those who don't have the time or don't want to cook, then they stick with us for life. So we have customers, many customers who have spent over $100,000 on methodology. Oh my God, that's amazing. And part of why part of why I ask that also and why I asked that question is because people spend their money in different ways as well. I mean, in, like I, for example, am not someone who goes out and spends thousands of dollars on a bag. That's just never been me. But I would spend money and I do spend money on my health and on my well-being and I'm making sure I feel good. And so I think it's just, it, it's important to note that I, I love that you admit and that you, you're not like trying to cover up the fact that you are a high-end item. You're a high-end service but with good reason. And that's why I asked that question because I wanted people to hear really and truly what goes into this product and how you are able to charge what you're able to charge because it's not for everybody. And I think that entrepreneurs, especially entrepreneurs listening to this, oftentimes have a hard time pricing their products or pricing their services. And they feel like, well, if it's not, you know, if it's not this low price, people aren't going to buy it. Well, you know what? Your your product might not be for everyone. You you don't need a low price, and you've proven that. And I and I love that you shared that because I think that it's so important to be transparent, um, both from a B two C and then also the B two B. I think it's important to share that knowledge with other entrepreneurs. So thank you. 
who designs the menu for you? Like you were talking about protein and macros and micros and all this stuff. Who are the experts that are helping you to develop these products? I think the reason why the methodology menus are so magical is because my co-founder and I are complete opposites and we design the menu together. So when we started methodology, he was living on burritos, <laughs> right? But he was a, an extreme foodie. He had traveled the world for, he had retired early. He's a genius who retired early in his twenties. And then for fun, spent seven years traveling the world, staging in fine dining kitchens. So he knew more about food than anyone I knew but also would live on burritos because he's like a total minimalist and uh, didn't know anything about health. You know, one of those people who can't gain weight even if he tries, right? So um, he was one of my best friends. And so the beauty of methodology and why our product is so sticky for so many people is there's, the, there's this beautiful push-pull between us where I'm fighting for the healthiness of the meals. Does that make sense? Like, no, we have to hit these macros. No, you cannot go one calorie over what we promise because, you know, it needs to be predictable or we have to hit our fiber targets or, you know, no, these are the illegal ingredient list is the illegal ingredient list. It is not changing, right? So there's me always fighting for the optimal healthy side of things. And then there's him fighting for the beauty, the presentation, the flavor of things, right? Uh, because that's his background. And so, um, a lot of other services in our space are only have founders like me. Like it might be two co-founders, but they're both like me. They both started it because they're very health conscious, but I'm very lucky. I have Stefan who just is a fine dining culinary genius. Um, like when all of our, when, when we've had executive chefs out for extended periods of time, like he can jump in and play the role of executive chef and can cook alongside any chef at any level, right? Um, and, and his food knowledge is insane. So we design the menus together. And so the way it works is I will often come up with a concept that I believe would sell well because I'm the one who lives on social media, creating content, consuming content. So I might create a con, I might create, um, I'll, I'll come to him with a concept like, oh, let's do, um, I was imagining this jar that's a breakfast oat parfait that's called easy like Sunday morning. And I wanted to have this very like relaxing vibe where, you know, the colors are like blue ombre and, you know, so I'll, I'll describe something like that, like a feeling and a look that I want. And it's very high level and conceptual. And then he will take that and he will bring it to life and figure out like, how do we actually create a recipe that fits everything that Julie wants? Right. And it hits the macros, but then it actually tastes good. And it's actually scalable um, in our production kitchen environment. And then we'll also have good shelf life, right? So he brings everything to life. And so that's how our partnership works and we love it. So from an operations standpoint, I just want to kind of get into this for a minute. So I know I read on your website, you started with two kitchen units and now you have eight. Is that correct still? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's amazing. So you have these eight kitchen units. Obviously you are cooking fresh food, and it is my understanding based on what I've read and kind of how I ordered my food that you send out food once a week, correct? So like, yeah, can you just correct. talk a little bit about the operation because you are, I mean, you're sending fresh food out and it's like, it's, this is a scalable operation of insane proportions. And like, how many meals do you send out a week or oh, how many yeah, customers? It's yeah, it's in. The, yeah, I mean, it's obviously it's in the thousands of customers, and so it's a ton of meals. Um, that's actually one of the reasons why we moved down to one delivery day because <laughs> we used to do two, um, and then we realized that most of our customers, the vast majority, really just want that one delivery because they want to do their own thing on weekends, which we encourage and we're fully behind. So it's great because we have only one delivery day. We basically spend the first two thirds of the week, just prepping, receiving what it's like to even just receive ingredients. I mean, it takes like a team of people just to unload pallets of food, check it, make sure we got all the right quantities, the quality is there, et cetera. Right. So just receiving, unloading and organizing food. Right. And then prepping things out, getting all the, what we call them cook sheets in order so that every cook knows uh, what they need to do on which days, right? We had to build custom software for all of this, actually. 
Because uh, nine years ago, I mean, I think that there are off-the-shelf solutions today. I don't know how good they are, but nine years ago, there was nothing. And so we needed a way that with what we do, because the menus constantly change. We're not like a restaurant, right? If you are cooking at scale like this with a menu that constantly changes, it's already hard at scale. And then if you ask the chefs to change their recipes every week, I mean, if you went to a restaurant and said, hey, guys, every week we're going to do a different menu, right? But you need to execute at the highest quality. Like they would freak out. And so we had to build software such that once the menus are designed and input into our software, the chefs basically just hit print. <laughs> and then all these cook sheets come out that are perfectly scaled with recipes down to the gram, right? Because we need to hit our nutrition facts accurately. And so we, I, I, I came from tech. So I worked with engineers to build this custom software internally because I managed the engineering, design, marketing, branding side of the business. And so that's, you know, we have this amazing tech stack that we probably invested, you know, one or $2 million of tech and engineering resources to build, but it's what enables us to create really high quality meals at scale on a menu that is constantly changing, but that also hits the nutrition standards. So you talked a little bit about your chef, the chef team, and you've talked about your co-founder. What does your team look like overall? Like just big picture? That's a great question. So we have about a hundred employees and there is a team at HQ on the, we call it the supply chain team. So they're cooking, receiving food, managing all the packaging inventory, picking and packing, shipping things out. There is another team that does just menu design, right? So they are just literally iterating on the menus constantly to improve them either for freshness, presentation, healthiness, et cetera. There is another team that just does recipe R&D, right, to develop new recipes and perfect them before they go on to the menu. Uh, and then there is a marketing team, right, and that has PR, content, social media, media buying. There is a customer service team that is very high touch and proactive. Um, there's obviously a business operations team that does everything from HR to finance to legal uh, and all of that. And yeah, that's roughly, oh yeah, there's also design and engineering, of course. There's a design team and there's an engineering team. So um, yeah, it takes a lot to create the methodology experience. You have built an insane operation, you and your co-founder, and I, and I want to commend you for that. And before I, I'm going to ask you two more questions, but I want to kind of go back to the beginning. And the, and the one thing that we haven't talked about yet is funding. So I know that you liquidated your retirement. We talked about that. And you definitely put your own funding into this. But I also know that you have had some investors and your first investor was someone who really believed in you. And so I want you to talk about I want you to talk about who that first investor was and what it meant for that first investor to get behind what you were building. Yeah, that's a great question. So my first investor was my mentor. I worked at a company called Lumosity and was working on methodology on the side at the time. And he, he is the person who like always believed in me. He was mentoring me to become COO of that tech company, but he saw how much I loved what I was doing with methodology and how much it just aligned with my passions in life. And so he who's still my mentor today, by the way, um, Kunal Sarkar, um, he wrote the first check into our seed round. And because of him, he helped convince in, you know, a couple institutionals to join. And so fundraising, you know, for at least just to, for that first seed, um, it happened because of him, because he, you know, he bet on me, which meant a lot. Um, cause I had worked for him for almost seven years at that tech company. So um, I remember him sitting down at lunch with me though. And he was like, I, he asked me, he's like, oh, how many people do you think would want to buy this product? Because it was, it was pricey at the time even. Even when we launched, it was a $25 product. So I was like, I don't know, maybe like 200, but that would have been enough for me. Like I was like, if I have 200 customers and have a lifestyle business, I'll be happy because I love what I do, right? Like that's just the way I felt at the time that I was ready to quit the job and 
uh, quit my tech job in tech and do this full time. And he was like, okay. And he still wrote the check for me, which is kind of hilarious. After that was my answer to that question. Like, I think we'll get 200 customers, good all. <laughs> and now we've had like over 125,000. So I think he's pretty happy with how things have gone. <laughs> Did you, did you, have you raised money again or did you just raise money the first time? We only raised, um, like a pre-seed and a seed and then we've never raised money again. So we became profitable around year three, three or four. And, um, we, we went to market for a series A and got term sheets that we turned down because basically like what the rate at, the, the business model that BC has didn't align with the way Stefan and I wanted to improve product quality and actually bring our mission to life. Um, because for us, it was a quality, we're, it's a quality play with methodology. Yeah. So. Well, so first of all, congratulations on being profitable. That's a huge, mm-hmm. huge, 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 huge undertaking and a huge goal and for any business owner. So you should be so proud of yourself. And number two, I just want to commend you for turning down that Series A because a big part of being a business owner is knowing when to say no, knowing when to pivot, knowing when it doesn't align with your mission. And if it doesn't align with your mission, doesn't matter how much money is going to, you know, could be, is put in, most likely you're not going to come out the other side. And so it's so important to recognize those things. And I really, I commend you for doing that and for sharing that because I think a lot of founders think that money solves everything. And yes, it is easier when you have money, but it doesn't always make it better. Yes. You know, I fully agree. I have no regrets on not turning that down because I, I have seen what has happened to my competitors' businesses after raising large series A's and what they've had to do to grow at expected levels and what's happened to their quality. And, and I knew it was going to happen and it would have happened to us as well. Because food doesn't scale the way software scales. Right. So, yeah. What's next for methodology? Oh, we have we have a lot of exciting product launches coming up. Um, probably by the time this goes live, we will have announced a new postpartum product called Hot Mom. Because that's been a huge request from our member base. Something that's just like very focused on new moms. And then we also have um, some new products we haven't announced yet. But we're going to do more things in the food and supplement and also just lifestyle space because we've always imagined this as a full lifestyle brand, which is why we picked the name methodology in the early days. We always wanted something that wasn't just food related because, um, yeah, we, we really represent a lifestyle of, Hey, this is for the customer who really wants to prioritize their health. And so what are all the touch points and things that they can have in their lives that will help them achieve their optimal health, but through products, where the form factor has been reimagined to be chic <laughs> um, and sustainable and all of the, you know, all those things at the same time. That's really what our brand is about. So we have um, my co-founder and I are working on a lot of pro- uh, projects that will be launching you know, over the next year. So Julie, before I let you go, I want you to, I'm going to ask you the same question that I ask everyone at the end. And that is what are three actionable tips that you would tell another female founder who's just getting started? Well, the first one is one that I want to repeat that I did earlier, said earlier on, because it is really important. It was one of the ones I prepared for this, which is that you don't really need to be a martyr or mule for your business because it really is going to take a lot longer in most cases where you think before you exit or if you decide to do what I do and want to just run the business forever because you love it, then you're going to need to find a way that the business can support you personally and professionally. So that is one piece of advice. Well, I need to check my notes for the other two. That's okay. <laughs> I don't remember. I wrote them down. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. The second one. Uh, give yourself way more time than you think you'll need to achieve your goals. In the early days, I used to set just very aggressive goals and deadlines and when we don't give ourselves enough time, we approach our problems with a desperation that leads to making decisions that deliver short-term results rather than long-term results. So Stephen and I, once we started running the business, always prioritizing for the long-term instead of the short-term, we started making decisions in a very different way. 
Um, and I think that is why our business has actually had a product that has improved year over year. Whereas most of our competitors, their product quality has degraded year over year. And I think the key to that is we are always thinking long term, um, about how to build things. And then, um, the last thing is another thing that Stefan and I do. I don't know if it's different is we know how to do every job at our business extremely well. We are so in the weeds. Like anyone who directly reports to us, I could take over their job and do it at least as well as they could. And the same for him. And we've been like this since day one and no job has been beneath us. I have mopped our entire warehouse floor. I have packaged food. I have worn a puffer jacket and been in the walk-in putting food into boxes for eight hour shifts, right? Everything from that to sending and coding marketing emails to making ads. And we, so we know every job in the business down in the minute detail. We know where every penny in the business flows in and out, right? Um, we know, so we know all the details of the business. We know all the details of the product experience. Um, there's only one customer who has eaten more methodology meals than I have. <laughs> and I, I just think it's because he's, well, he's not single anymore, but for most of his you know, tenure with us, he's been with us and Jerry's a single man. So he just eats more, but, um, uh, no one knows our product inside and out the way we do. So, um, I think that even as we have scaled and built out the team, we have never stopped knowing the details of the business because this is how we can come up with ideas that actually are going to have an impact. This is how we know whether employees are doing their jobs or not. Right. Um, and this is really how we like generate the best ideas, frankly, because like, for example, if you don't know every detail of how the kitchen flows, how are you going to come up with a menu that you are, you know, a new menu item that you are sure the kitchen can produce, right. Optimally and profitably. You need to literally know how every, minute of the kitchen is structured and what that flow is of traffic and what the talent level is. And it's the same for marketing, right? Um, I, if, if we're going to have like a campaign live that we're going to spend a lot of money on, right? I need to make sure I need to be like really in the weeds. Like I'm so in the weeds. If you look at a methodology ad or a photo, I have picked the earrings on the model. I have picked the model. I have picked the garnish on the meal. I have picked the meal that has gone with the outfit. I have picked the song that is in the background. Like, and, and I think this is why our product, when you experience it, has the attention to detail that blows every competitor out of the water. So I cannot emphasize to you, if you're in the luxury space, specifically like us, or when I say luxury, I mean, you are charging significantly more than any of your competitors and you need to deliver on that. And I think the only way is literally, you know, all the little touch points that you improve and you think about, they all add up and matter. Any one of them doesn't matter. We've never taken the approach of, oh, that's so little. No, no, will notice. It doesn't matter. From day one, we said every little thing matters. It all adds up. And that's what creates the methodology experience. That's what creates the brand loyalty. That's what makes us a must have product instead of a nice to have product. Julie Nguyen, thank you so much for being here and for sharing so much knowledge and wisdom and information. I'm even more obsessed with your business than I was when we started this conversation. And um, I just want to thank you so much. So thank you again for being here. Thank you for having me. I cannot wait to hear how you feel, most importantly, after you taste our food. I can't wait to try it. If you liked today's conversation, we would love it if you scrolled to the bottom of our podcast page on Apple or Spotify and left a five-star rating or review. That is how other people find us and the amazing guests and stories that we share here. If you want to try methodology, you can use the code DEARFOUNDER for 10% off your first order. And before we go, I want to share my top takeaway from today's conversation with Julie Nigan. That is this, don't be a martyr or a mule for your business. Find a way that your business can support you both personally and professionally. This is a hard one, but it's important to remember, especially as you grow. You're not in a race, so go at your own pace and make sure that what you're doing works for you. Thank you so much, Julie, for being here. Make sure that you follow her on social media for more. Her link is in the show notes as well. For now, I want to thank you so much for listening and thank you for being here. Stay tuned for another amazing conversation coming your way next week on Dear Found Her. Dear Founder.